Okay, thank you. I am incredibly excited to be here today. Uh, I'm super passionate about DevOps and I'm super passionate about Seattle, so two great tastes that taste great together. And I wanna spend basically the next 30 minutes talking about my abysmal failures in DevOps. Uh, so hopefully that you can learn from my mistakes. Uh, one disclaimer, I tried to do something a little different with this particular talk. I hand drew all of my slides, uh, which means I only have about six or seven. Uh, but an insane amount of content to try and get through in 30 minutes. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback on these slides. Uh, don't throw anything at me. Maybe just pull me aside after. And, uh, you know, e even if you're like, look, I, oh, God, Paulie, don't ever do that again. I struggled for 30 minutes to keep my breakfast down. So I've worked at Hearst for almost two years now. That is a self-portrait of me, by the way, if you don't think that's good. It's just really kind of downhill from here in the <laughs> graphics department. <laughs> so let me apologize up front. I was hired to work with 10 business units uh, regarding transformational change with Agile, DevOps, Lean. And those business units are broken up into three market verticals. There's the healthcare, there's transportation, and there's finance. Now, I went out to all the business units to start to get to know them better, to really start to focus on what their unique challenges were, where they were in the journey, what their maturation was. And I realized fairly early on that these business units weren't communicating with one another. And so I had this idea that I mentioned to my leadership and said, hey, what if we created a big enterprise-wide community where we broke down the barriers not just between the teams in the business units, but how about we do it between the business units? And leadership was like, hey, that's a great idea, Paula. We should absolutely do that. How are you going to make that successful? And I said, eh, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of had an idea. I didn't really have a plan at all. So I learned a valuable lesson. If you mention something that's a good idea to leadership, make sure you have a plan in your pocket. Because they like take that stuff really seriously. So I'm like, all right, Paula, you need a plan. Now. For me, as uh, probably is with the same for most of you, I rely pretty heavily on my past experiences to make decisions about my future, whether I'm trying to solve a problem or come up with a plan. Unfortunately, I also recognize that I have a couple of minor shortcomings, uh, and I, I'm aware about these things, so I try to mitigate them as much as I can, one of which is I sometimes get a little too biased about my past experiences. So I rely or lean on those too heavily. Uh, so what I didn't want to do here was take one of the transformational ideas that worked really well for me with regards to a smaller company, say 200, 300 people, and then just make it bigger. That to me was sort of equivalent of having a recipe that's delicious for four to 10 people and then just doubling it until it feeds 10,000. And if any of you have ever been to reInvent, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, and so I recognized that I was going to have to reach out and do a little more research, right? Probably field research. Uh, go to conferences like this. Um, and also, I wanted to make sure that I didn't become too myopic. Now, this is probably my biggest problem, especially when there's technology and a kind of fun challenge involved. Uh, I have a tendency to kind of get too wrapped around the axle. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, when my son was very young, he was reliant upon a sound machine to rest, to sleep, right? We wanted to wean him off this sound machine for several different reasons. So I came up with this brilliant idea of, well, why don't we just move the sound machine a little further away from the bed every night? You know, maybe put an extension cord on it, run it down the hall. And my wife said, well, why don't you just turn it down a little bit more every night? And I said, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you want to do it the easy way, I guess, you know. <laughs> but I'm an engineer, okay? That guy knows what I'm talking about. I'd already broken out, like, my Arduino boxes. I had a Lego train set down the hall. You know, I'd, I had... I was graphing the distance the train was traveling in graphite. I'd already bought the domain name. So the problem there was I, I got a little wrapped around that axle, right? Maybe a smidge too involved and not really thinking outside the box. The good thing there was that I did receive collaboration and I was amenable to it. I just didn't ask for it. So I recognized that that was a problem of mine sometimes. So I thought collaboration. This is a great way to have a foundation, sort of an MVP, that I could build on from that point forward. We would make collaboration the basis of everything we would do from that point forward. I also have the distinct pleasure and honor of knowing a lot of people, super smart, intelligent people in the, in the DevOps community. So I thought, what a great idea. I can just reach out also and get feedback on this idea. So it's not just, again, me getting too myopic. So 
as an example, I, I called Gene Kim and said, you know, hey, you know, this is my idea. I'm thinking about this as sort of a foundational idea, and I'll build on this, and we'll expand it to all 25,000 employees. And, you know, I'll never forget what Gene said to me. Dramatic pause. He, he said, he said, uh, good Lord, Paulie, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and how'd you even get this number? And that, you know, that really stuck with me, right? Um, because I think what Gene was really saying, and I'm paraphrasing here because it's a family show, uh, was that there's never too late to really focus on competent and effective communication. So I thought, that's it. I'm going to take Gene's advice, <laughs> and I'm going to do communication as the basis. Now, that's important because without communication, you really can't do any of the other things. So I took this roadmap. I went out to the business units. I talked to the executives and said, okay, you know, here's the roadmap. This is how we're going to get from here to there. And uh, we're going to focus on culture and process and tools, right, all the normal kind of stuff. We're not going to try and change your culture. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on lean principles and agile and DevOps, and we're going to drive the behaviors that we want to see. And then that will influence your culture. And yes, we will be focusing on your unique challenges, but at the same time, we're going to be focusing on the bigger challenges and breaking down these barriers between the business units. I created a maturity model, and the maturity model would cl provide clear communication on where they were in that journey. Okay, so Father's Day is coming up, so I told my dad, I made him a promise that I would include him in this talk. Um, so I want you to notice here that like, from age, like, I don't know, 55 to 70, his fashion just kind of screeches to a halt. Uh, so that's my homage to my dad, who basically at 55 was like, this is it, this is the last pair of clothes I'm ever buying. And I'm just gonna wear them until they just disintegrate, re you know, revealing a bathrobe and slippers underneath. So that's for you, Dad, I love you. Okay, communication was the basis, right? So this is where we're starting. So how do we go about executing this plan? Now I know you're gonna say, Polly, this is really simplistic and that's only because it is really simplistic, but I'm a big believer in Occam's razor and the simple solution is often the most correct. So I started with chat. Now chat, you know, obviously Hearst didn't invent chat, right? I didn't invent chat. They had tried chat before, but they took a very sort of IT corporate approach to it as a company of 25,000 plus people would. And you're probably familiar with this. You know, they, they pushed out software to your laptop. It was hooked up to AD so you could search for other people. And you could use it to talk to someone if you wanted to. The difference here was I tried to rally everyone under a, you know, around a cause. So for me, it was about collaboration and it was about getting people together to innovate and to be creative. It was about building a community, not just deploying a tool. So the kind of fun and cool thing here was that we built the community together, right? So we had guidelines, and we agreed on those guidelines as a community. There were no NSA. There were no secret police. We policed the, the community as a community as well. Complete opt-in if you wanted to download the software and be a part of the community. That's awesome. We would love to have you. If not, that's OK, too. And we started with about, about 50 folks, and it ballooned to 800 very quickly. And this is cool because, again, it's opt-in. So those people wanted to be there. So you are creating and collaborating with a community that wants to be part of the community. Now, some managers did have some concerns, right? There was some worry that people were going to sit around all day and just watch cat videos and you know, not actually get any work done. This, by the way, is an accurate representation of how I play golf. And there I go. I think that's a pretty reasonable response for missing a one-foot putt, don't you? I wasn't worried about this. I was more worried about no one even using the product at all, right? Everyone being like, oh, great, another BS application I got to keep up with. Well, luckily, it turns out we were both wrong. Luckily for us, people started helping each other very quickly, and that's why it ballooned up. It was all about getting people together that wanted to help each other. Now, of course, it started in the teams first, as you would expect. Then it moved to the internal BU. Then the real fun started happening when across the BUs, people started helping each other. Even during like outages, people were joining hands and helping each other during an outage, one in a completely different market than the other. And then the real magic happened. And this is where ad hoc, self-formed, cross-functional teams created rooms and developed innovative products without any input from leadership. 
they just got together. They just made it happen. Why? Because they were passionate and they wanted to, and now they had an avenue to do it. This was awesome. They were creating products that could be pushed up, sold, and generate revenue for the business. All from just communicating. Seems simple, right? So I'm like, hey, sweet. Mission accomplished, right? All I need is a podium and an aircraft carrier. I can drop this mic and walk away. Well, <laughs> not exactly, right? So I love analogies. So I'm going to tell you an analogy that I'll use through the rest of this talk, and that is I like to think of the product that they created, that this cross-functional team created, as an airplane. And they got one brave soul from that group to get, climb up into the cockpit and fly this plane, right? Uh, and that's sort of pitching it to leadership. So they taxi the plane out onto the runway. They turn it. Our brave pilot kind of gives us a salute, thumbs up, throttles up. It rumbles down the runway. It's up to 200 miles an hour. It careens into the trees at the end of the runway in this massive fireball. Uh, and I kind of imagine everyone just kind of like, hey, oh, gee, oh my god, oh, the horror. What happened, Polly? And once again, I'm like, yeah, I'll get back to you. I don't know. So all I know for sure is things went horribly wrong. So I need to figure out why. So I try to be introspective at this point. This is in the beginning of December of 2015. And I'm like, I, I've got all of this figured out, right? Uh, I've got a solid roadmap built on foundational principles. It's built with artifacts and documents that reinforce the roadmap. I have a maturity model that makes sense, and I'm clearly communicating that. So why am I failing? So I said, OK, I'm going to go back to the business units, and I'm going to talk to the CTOs. I said, OK, listen, I am dedicated to you guys being successful, but I'm failing. And I'm, I'm perfectly willing to admit that. I just need to figure out how we, we get past this. And I said, I'm going to have a conversation with you, right? And it's going to be open. And it's going to be honest. I'm going to be vulnerable. There may be tears. We may hug. I don't know what's going to happen. We're just going to go with it. Now, the great thing here was that they were just as open and honest with me because I led with that. Again, all back to communication, right? Now, good or bad, they all said essentially the same two things, which is good because there was consensus. Um, unfortunately, they were all my fault. Um, and so the first thing was like, hey, look, Paula, you came in here in the beginning of 2015. You had this roadmap. You had this idea. We love it. We agree with it. And you kind of dumped it on us. And we already had our resources allocated for the year both budget, uh, people, right? The projects are all planned out. And now, I don't know how we're going to accomplish all this extra stuff without additional resources. So huge resource constraint problem. And I was like, OK, ooh, uh, yeah, all right. I hear you, I hear you. Uh, number two, again, love the roadmap. Looks good. Uh, I totally agree with everything on it. But it's a bit prescriptive. Uh, so you know, you, you kind of didn't ask us. And I was like, ooh, ouch. Oh, that's collaboration. Sound familiar to a couple of stories earlier, right? So I fell victim to those anyway. And why? Because I got wrapped around the axle, because I love engineers and I love code. <laughs> and so I lost sight. I stayed too long with the individual contributors, and I didn't include the leadership early enough. I said, OK, no problem. No problem. We can fix this. Let's look at 2015 as a building year and a learning year. And let's look at 2016 as a brand new year with a fresh new DevOps scent. You know, by the, by, the, by the end of 2016, DevOps will smell like a fresh Carolina pine forest. Resource constraints. First, I went out and hired three incredible people. I, I hired, you know, Levi Smith and Aaron Blythe and Alexa Alley, and we formed a consulting team, and they're phenomenal. And what we do there is we go out and do month-long dedicated engagements where we're embedded with the business unit. So we help them. We don't do work for them and give them a product. We help them get that kicked off, right? If you, if you're interested in buzzword bingo, right, force multipliers. And so the idea there is that they don't feel so much onus on them to figure out something brand new. We help them with that, and then we support them throughout the process. I started going around and doing value stream mapping workshops. These are three-day workshops I do at business units. And this allows the executives to get together and really focus on where we're seeing barriers to flow and where we're seeing too much in, in the form of queues. And we start really building out where we want to be. And so this is starting to address the second issue around collaboration. So I took my roadmap and my maturity model, that's the actual documents there, and I chucked those into the trash and said, OK, you have the contextual knowledge of your business unit. 
you tell me what you want on the roadmap. So we used the value stream map alongside the, uh, the old roadmap and some guidance from myself, and we built out all new roadmaps that were uniquely uh, guided towards each individual business unit. So this was fantastic. The business uh, leaders were like, hey, I can see actual value coming from this. I could see business value derived from this. So count me in. I'm on board. I'm like, awesome. Now mission accomplished, right? No, no. Um, so we taxied the new plane out. Uh, Arguably, it's getting harder and harder to get pilots up into the cockpit. Um, but I'm like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. That last guy didn't know what he was doing. Trust me. Uh, so throttle up. We starts rumbling down the runway, and everyone's just like holding their breath with anticipation. It gets close to the end. It rotates. It lifts off, barely misses the trees, right? Wheels come up, and everyone's just like, much rejoicing. And then it kind of settles down into the forest into a fireball. And I'm like, oh, crap. Um, I'll be back. <laughs> so what happened? I, I don't understand. I, I felt like I had such great consensus. I had the people who signed the checks and pushed the agendas on board. I had the people who did the actual work on board. There's no one left. Why is this plane not able to sustain flight? Who am I missing that needs to provide additional lift? At this particular time, I was reading a book by a gentleman um, named Nietzsche. And I've read this book a couple of times if you've never read him. He's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, and the book is called The Birth of Tragedy. Now, you're going to have to give me a little bit of poetic license here um, because it doesn't fit exactly, but this is where my frame of mind was at the time, so I wanted to share this with you. Now, in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche talks about these two diametrically opposed intellectual perspectives. On one side, you have the Apollonian. Now, roughly speaking, the Apollonian perspective really, uh, really sort of encompasses and accepts control and order. And you have the Dionysian, and the Dionysian is the antithesis, right? So it really accepts and looks for sort of chaos and change and accepts disorder. And I started thinking about how Apollonian kind of reminded me a little bit of leadership. You know, leadership likes to prognosticate. They like to forecast numbers. They like to control where they are in the marketplace. They want order. They want to be able to know where they're going. Dionysian reminded me more of engineers, right? We expect them to be create, creatists, right? We expect them to make something from nothing with only a little bit of information. So I started thinking, OK, well, all right, who's left? There must be someone left, and I can't figure out who I'm missing. For me, it was that person right there. It was middle management. And uh, you know, unfortunately for me, I kind of overlooked them, and I kind of feel like they often feel overlooked. I was a middle manager once. Arguably, I still am, depending on how you define the role middle manager. And so. I was like, okay, the, I need to really understand why middle managers are having such a hard time. They're really in an unenviable position where they're stuck between both of these worlds, and they have to manage up and down simultaneously. They have to create results, put them into format that's consumable by leadership, and simultaneously cultivate creativity from the engineers. And oftentimes doing this within two hours of one another, right? I mean, it's really, really rapid how quickly a middle manager has to change from, from one hat to the other. So I needed to understand, OK, why? why? What's driving the behaviors here? Why, why am I seeing these results? There's a reason for everything, right? And so I started with looking at three big things, incentives, drivers, and fears. So my objective was hopefully this would help me to understand the behaviors. Now, in this case, incentives are really goal-oriented. I'm speaking here around goals. Now, there's lots of different incentives, right? You, maybe you're incentivized to be here today to hear people talk. Maybe you're incentivized to be here today to uh, network and meet other people. Maybe you're incentivized to be here today just to get away from your boss for two days, right? In the case of corporate America, goals are pretty important, and you kind of can't get rid of them, even though I'd love to. So I recognized that middle managers were predominantly goal-driven at an individual level. And what happened inadvertently was that their goals were not always aligned with their team goals. Oh, uh, sorry, can you not hear me? Is this better? Um, <laughs> uh, so their, their goals were uh, very individualistic, and that was a big problem. So I realized maybe we should take a step back and make sure all the goals are aligned, not just the middle managers. So we started with business goals, and we made sure that they were clearly articulated and started with why. The business really needed to define for us why we're doing this. Why are we doing DevOps? Why are we doing Agile? Why are we transforming? Why are we in this market? 
Then we took those and distilled those down into team goals, and we really heavily focused on team goals and minimized individual goals. The reason for this was essentially so that I could try and draw in the middle manager into a collaborative mindset so that they could be part of this innovation rather than feeling apart from it. And I think that was a big sentiment. Right? They felt like the individual contributors were working on this cool stuff and I'm stuck here just doing HR stuff and approving PTO and I don't get to do anything fun. It's like, okay, well, we can fix that. And of course, DevOps initiatives that were on the roadmap were also interwoven into the team goals. Uh, we didn't often use the word DevOps. Um, in some organizations, it has a bit of a negative connotation. Um, not that it's a bad thing, but it, people feel like it's a little overplayed. So that's fine. I think the ideals behind DevOps are still rock solid. And so we just made sure that those roadmap items were part of the overall goals. Drivers for us, extrinsic, not really a big deal. Um, the, the pay and comp packages, all those things were, were pretty comparable across all the businesses, so people weren't really as worried about that as they were intrinsic rewards, right? And so this kind of boiled down after all the, the interviews to three big things, right? Who you work with, who you work for, and what you work on. Who you work with, I focused heavily on making sure that there were avenues of communication so that there were peer groups for middle managers. And this is across business units too, right? So the idea is I have some unique challenges, or they feel unique to me, right? Everyone kind of faces the same challenges, but when they're yours, they feel more personal and more unique, right? I'm, I am special, just like everyone else kind of thing. And so we made sure that everyone could communicate in a safe way and kind of share those challenges and collaborate on how they could work together to fix them. Now, who you work for, that's just us making sure that the relationship between leadership and the middle managers was a solid one. They were providing air cover, they were providing resources, but most importantly, that they were not just providing lip service around empowerment, right? If you say, yeah, you know, I want you to innovate, then you have to be willing to let middle managers take some risks. And what you work on, this is where we focused on things like DevOps and Agile and Lean and other you know, methodologies and principles to try and free up some of the time for middle managers so that they had an opportunity to work on innovative ideas, right? We're telling them we want them to do this. Uh, we now need to provide them the platform to do so. Now, the interesting thing is this is a great segue into fears because somehow by me doing all of this stuff and automating and people were coming up to me saying, Paulie, I'm really worried about you automating me out of a job. And I said, well, okay, well, talk to me about that. What's going on? And the ironic thing was they weren't really worried about being automated out of a job. They were, quite frankly, more worried about being DevOpsed out of a job. And what I mean by that was I was pushing hard to move decision-making down and out in the organizations. Now, when you do that, you also have to flatten the organization with regards to accountability. If I have people making decisions, they should be held accountable for them, not the middle. I mean, they're responsible too, but that should be shared accountability. So I started coming up with this little mantra where I said, okay, it's sort of like a loss of what I call CPR. And this was the fear, the fear of loss of control, the fear of loss of power, and the fear of loss of resources. And so I started saying, well, what about if I told you, I don't know, maybe, maybe we don't need middle managers. <laughs> And the response I got was, I knew, I knew, I knew you were going to fire me. And I was like, whoa, no one said anything about firing. I'm saying, maybe I don't need you to do all this menial tasks, these little brush fires that burn up half your day every day. Maybe instead of being a middle manager, maybe I need middle leaders. I need you to lead from the middle. I need someone that can lead change. I need someone that can lead innovation. I need someone that can lead their teams, and you don't even have time to do that right now. And it's not your fault. Now, here's the cool thing. I still think it's you. I still think you're the right person for the job. The organization is transforming. You, can, you can't help that. We're, we're going to do this. We have to do this to remain competitive in our, mar in our market. Wait, we have to. What I want is I want you to transform with us. Now, this is not like this miracle that happens overnight, right? Um, leadership is hard, and it's like a muscle. It takes time, it takes effort, and it takes work. And just like when you go to the gym, you have to burn calories, the business has to burn calories too. If it's only you saying, I want to be a better leader, and the business is like, yeah, that's awesome, let me know when you get there. 
kind of sucks, right? It's a partnership. It's a symbiotic relationship. So for me, I was like, okay, we really need to focus on burning our own calories on this, you know, through mentorships and training. A lot of these middle managers that want to become middle leaders are new at management. They've never done this before. They need us to help them. And a lot of times, we just kind of throw them out there. So when I, be, I was promoted to, promoted to uh, a manager a long time ago when I was a developer. And I felt like I was fighting fires and I was providing val value through like guerrilla warfare. That's kind of how I thought about it. And I'm in the trenches with my buddies. And then one day somebody comes along and grabs me by the scruff of my neck and throws me into the middle of a minefield and goes, congratulations, you've been promoted to manager. And I said, it's not really a promotion. Um, it's kind of a job change. Like I'm not even doing anything the same anymore. And I felt like any step I took in any direction had the potential to blow up in my face, and no one was there to help guide me through this minefield. And the real fear was, I now have people behind me that they stuck onto me. Now, if I step on a landmine, I've got collateral damage. And they did nothing wrong other than that they were told to blindly follow the blind guy. So this is what we focused on, and we had all the middle leaders on board, very excited, very empowered. We're helping them along. We're doing this together. So, once again, we pull that plane out onto the runway. Now it's virtually impossible to find anybody to fly this thing. Uh, so we, you know, we get the new guy because he doesn't, he doesn't know. Um, just sweating profusely, and I'm like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Those other two guys, man, I know what they were doing. You know what you're doing. <sighs> so throttle up. It rumbles down the runway. Now literally no one's breathing, right? We're all just holding our breath like, oh, God, if, if this initiative doesn't work, I'm not sure I've got enough sweat equity here to try another one. I'll just have to go work somewhere else. It gets to the end of the runway, and it's tight. It's close. It rotates. It lifts up. The wheels scrape the trees, and it's off. And that plane is flying. No, wait, it's soaring. And all because we focused heavily on this last bit, because it ended up being the most important piece of the whole puzzle. We focused on getting the, the middle leaders engaged and incentivized to be part of the team. We made sure that they had an avenue to talk about stuff when things were hard, a safe environment for them to do that, so that they could talk frankly with other middle leaders. We allayed their concerns and fears by saying, listen, man, I am out here in the middle of the minefield with you, and we'll go together. And if we step on a mine, we step on a mine. But we're together out here. And it was just that little bit of communication and trust, and really, frankly, burning not a ton of calories to do this either, by the way. And that was it. Now we had the whole organization aligned, and we were able to hit speeds and velocities that I didn't even know were possible. And we were creating now products and innovative ideas completely ad hoc and we're driving internal satisfaction. So that's my story. Thank you so much for spending it with me, and I appreciate it.